Hello and welcome to Nature Knowledge. This is a speaker series with experts sharing scientific knowledge on current issues affecting nature in Florida. I'm your host, Dr. Shelley Johnson, State Specialized Agent in Natural Resources with University of Florida IFAS Extension. Thanks for joining us today. So our topic for today is talking about Florida Springs and more specifically talking about the CRISPS project which is science to restore and protect Florida Springs. And this was a project um, looking at how to address or try and understand some of the human influences that are happening with the springs um, in specific to the St. Johns River Water Management District area, I believe. So we'll learn more about that from our speaker today. Um, Rob Matson is a senior environmental scientist with the St. Johns River Water Management District He's been with the district for 15 years. He was previously a biologist with the Suwannee River Water Management District for 17 years. Um, he has his BA in biology, MS degree in zoology from the University of South Florida. So I'm excited to have him here today to share this, um, a little bit of information about this project with us. Um, I've heard a little bit about this before, but I um, am always interested in learning more. So. With that, I'm going to go ahead and um, throw the screen share over to Rob. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to let him um, take it away. Okay. Um, thank you, Shelley. And uh, so let's uh, get my program up, which I hope it is now. Um, yes, looks good. Okay. So uh, I, I, you know, looking at the attendance numbers, I, I got to think this might be the um, largest group I've ever spoken to, live or otherwise. So um, yeah, talk about the uh, a project we completed uh, just uh, just a few years ago, the CRISPS project, and I'll I'll get into that. Um, let's see. So I always like to go back in a little bit of history. So uh, I mean, the springs of Florida have been used by the residents of Florida for quite literally thousands of years. Uh, they attracted game, they provided fish and shellfish resources and, and clean fresh water, perhaps most importantly. Um, when Europeans first arrived in Florida, the, um, uh, they mainly encountered in, in the northern and central peninsula the Timucua people. Uh, and there was a large Timucuan village uh, in a province they called Ocali near Silver Springs when Hernando de Soto and his men came through the area, um, one of them kept a journal and they described the village as containing uh, uh, as many as 600 dwellings. And then of course, going back to the original European that landed in Florida, uh, Ponce de Leon um, in the 16th century, of course, the, the legend, the fairy tale is that he was, he was searching for a spring whose waters were reputed to rejuvenate old men AKA the Fountain of Youth. Of course, we now have debunked that. He was looking for land and, and, and wealth to become a wealthy man and to earn the favor of his king. Um, but yet the Fountain of Youth kind of maybe never died, uh, at least during much of the 19th century, a number of Florida Springs, particularly the ones that were somewhat more mineralized or sulfurous were developed as uh, health spas and health resorts. People would would come to take the waters, to bathe in it, drink it. Uh, it was reputed to cure all sorts of, of ailments. And then uh, the Florida Springs kind of morphed into the, uh, the tourist attraction. So what, what I like to say in a lot of my talks is, you know, before people came to Florida for the beaches, they came to Florida for the springs. Uh, and, and they were kind of the original Florida tourist attractions. The picture on the left there, after the Civil War, a, uh, a businessman here in Palatka, Hubbard Hart, uh, had a small fleet of special built steamboats constructed and he would um, load people up in Palatka and, uh, and, and tow them up the St. John's and Okawaha rivers and up the Silver River to Silver Springs where they could rent a rowboat and row out over the springs. Um, during the Civil War, he ran a couple of steamboats on the Okawaha transporting supplies for the Confederacy. So he kind of leveraged that knowledge into a, a successful business. And then of course, by the 1950s, 60s, Silver Springs was uh, 
uh, one of the biggest uh, attractions, not only in Florida, but possibly in, in, in the country. Uh, and then along that same time, uh, uh, Newt Perry developed Wikiwachi Spring, the Spring of Live Mermaids, Rainbow Spring, Wakulla Spring were also attractions, and um, Homosassa Spring, the Nature's Fishbowl. So, um, you know, in terms of just natural resources, I think springs to Florida are what its beaches are, uh, what, um, what, what attracted people. And the, the karst geology of Florida uh, leads to the fact that Florida has probably one of the largest concentrations of springs in the world. I guess I'm being a little circumspect, maybe the largest concentration. Um, over a thousand springs are, are mapped in the Florida Geological Survey database. And that figure there, 1,089, is two, three years old. So there might even be more now. And Florida Springs have a no number of, of um, priority type designations, as I've indicated on that slide. Most recently in 2016, the Florida legislature passed the Florida Springs and Aquifer Protection Act in an attempt to um, better manage and, and restore and protect Florida Springs. Couple things to just sort of get out of the way, some, some real uh, basics, foundational things. Fact number one, many Florida Springs have exhibited very substantial increases in nitrogen concentrations over the past few decades, which we mainly measure in springs as nitrate nitrite nitrogen or NOx. And this is a graph, a time series graph showing four of the major springs in the St. John's River Basin, Wakaiwa Rock, blue near Orange City and, and Silver Springs, what we call Volusia blue. Um, and you can see the, 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 the steady upward trends in, in, in NOx concentrations. The Florida Geological Survey regards background nitrate or NOx as around 0 0.05 milligrams per liter or parts per million. But uh, you know these uh, along with other springs are now exhibiting NOx uh, concentrations 10 times, 20 times higher than that, uh, than that natural background. And then the other basic fact is, is that many Florida springs and their spring runs, the spring run streams that, that they give rise to, have exhibited substantial changes in their uh, primary producer or submerged aquatic, submerged aquatic vegetation communities over the past several decades. And this uh, graphic here on the left is uh, Wakiwachi Spring. Uh, over about a 50 some odd year period. Historically, the head springs supported extensive beds of submerged macrophytes and you know, rooted vascular plants, probably either Valisneria americana or Sagittaria persiana. Uh, whereas nowadays, you know, much of the head spring is covered by these benthic uh, filamentous algal mats, uh, primarily of uh, um, a blue green, a cyanobacteria, Lingbi uolii. Uh, and then on the right, uh, if the spring for Silver Springs, you know, maybe if it didn't lose its macrophytes, you can see substantially higher burdens or loads of epiphytic algae growing on the blades of the, uh, of the macrophytes. So nitrate changes and vegetation changes, and there is some quantitative data for the vegetation changes. Uh, some years ago, the um, district funded a project to um, look at the, in the early 2000s, the current condition of Silver Springs and compare with the data that H.T. Odom collected there 50 years ago. And, and we, the overall conclusion of that was that the macrophyte communities were stable, but very significant increases in algal abundance, both epiphytes and macroalgal mats. Uh, my good friend, Dr. Tom Frazier, used to be with UF, now with USF, um, did done quite a bit of work in the Homosassa uh, for a period between the late 90s and early 2000s. And, and he documented the loss of the macrophyte beds and replacement with the algal mats in, in the Homosassa River. I worked a little bit in that river when I was with consulting after I got my master's degree and remember it heavily vegetated with uh, Valsneria, which is not there now. And then anecdotally over my years at Swanee, I saw these changes occur at Manatee Spring, a complete flip over from a submerged macrophyte dominated to a filamentous algal dominated system. And more recently to my good friends, Tom Morris and Pete Butt with Karst Environmental Services, seen some of the same things happening in the lower Santa Fe River and its springs. And some of the drivers behind this, obviously we've been looking heavily at those increases in nitrates because it is a fertilizer 
Although as I'll, I'll touch on in a bit, it can be inhibitory to, uh, to MAC5 growth, um, possibly hydrologic changes, uh, changes in current regimes due to reduced spring flows, spring discharges, possibly biological changes, the loss of the things that consume or graze on algae for various reasons, or changes in light or changes in other um, dissolved constituents uh, that act as nutrients to plants. So in 2013, in an attempt to get a handle on this for uh, the St. John's River Springs and hopefully be able to help with other uh, springs efforts throughout the state, the uh, St. John's River Water Management launched a springs protection initiative, which consisted of really two main elements, a, a science or a research component, uh, much of which was a, a big contract with the University of Florida that I'm mainly going to talk about in this uh, program, and then a projects component where we provide cost share funding to um, help local partners implement projects which either reduce groundwater use and or both uh, reduce nutrient loading to the, to the landscape. Um, so those were, and I'll briefly touch on projects uh, towards the end of this talk, if I have time. So um, we kind of envisioned this, this initiative as, as kind of being able to help tie, to take the science and help tie it into, you know, some of the ongoing statutory things that the water management district does, our regulatory programs and our water supply planning programs. And again, maybe help guide the implementation of projects to uh, help uh, change some of what we've been seeing in springs. And then also efforts like this, the outreach to, to, to talk about what we've learned. So a big element of the science component was what we call the Collaborative Research Initiative on Sustainability and Protection of Springs. This was a, a big contract, $3 million with the University of Florida conducted kind of under the auspices of the Water Institute that uh, Wendy Graham heads. Uh, it ran for three years. The main focus was on Silver Springs. We decided to really kind of hit that one hard because of the historic data that Odom had collected and that other folks had collected over the years. It's a very multidisciplinary project. Um, it involved multiple uh, groups and colleges from, from University of Florida, uh, soil and water science, the Whitney Marine Lab out at Marine, La uh, Marine Land, um, fisheries and aquatic sciences, forest resources and conservation, uh, environmental engineering, geology, uh, and it, it studied the whole range of things from hydrogeology to biology. That final report is available on our website at that URL down below, and it's also available on the Water Institute website. The three main objectives that we kind of settled on were number one, try to advance the science, you know, improve the scientific foundation, mainly for uh, managing nitrate loading to springs. Number two, evaluate whether um, focusing on nitrate or reduction in nitrate will help tip that balance, you know, inhibit the filamentous algal proliferation and, and enable some recovery of the submerged macrophytes. And then the third thing was if, if, it's, if it's not nitrate or what in addition to nitrate do we need to be looking at? So what is the influence and manageability of, of non-nitrate drivers? In this case, focusing on that submerged vegetation community, the primary producer communities, the macrophytes and the, and the algae. So the overall effort was organized into these six work groups, those middle smaller boxes, um, kind of the impetus for this was a few years before this project with the water management district here, we did another huge science project, the St. John's River water supply impact study that some of you might be familiar with, but that also was organized into these uh, work groups, these discipline specific work groups, but um, an, an effort was made to, to have these work together. The first three work groups there were more focused on the landscape, the um, uh, recharge area, the spring shed that provided water recharge to um, Silver Springs. So we kind of call them the spring shed supergroup. And the other three groups were um, focused more on the spring ecosystem itself, S Silver Springs and the Silver River. Uh, so we call those the spring ecosystem supergroup. Each one of these work groups had a senior district scientist in charge and then a professor from UF uh, both of these folks sort of served as co-PIs. Of course, I was uh, the guy in charge of the biology 
along with Dr. Frazier. So most of the meat of this talk, we'll kind of go through those objectives and what did we find and you know, what, what do we think it means and can it be applied to other springs? That was a, a big question. So um, improving the scientific foundation for management of nitrate loading to springs. Some of the things we found, um, which were not necessarily brand new, but we tried to, you know, we think this helped advance the science. So for Silver River, um, land use is, is a big influence on nitrate concentrations, both in soils and in the underlying aquifer. Again, we kind of knew that already, but uh, we, we, we um, learned some more. Um, within several kilometers of the Silver Springs head spring group, it appeared that groundwater flow is primarily uh, very quick through conduits and fractures. And we also learned that there, there is quite a bit of denitrification occurring both in the soils and, and down in the aquifer. This is a chemical process where certain bacteria take dissolved nitrate or ammonium and turn it back into, into nitrogen gas, N2. So that's a way of getting rid of, of the, um, the nitrogen in the water that's acting as a, as, a, as a pollutant. So, and one of the ways we'd hope to apply some of this knowledge is, is kind of conceptually looking at the Silver Springs and other spring spring sheds. We know we're going to have areas like with high, where there's high water conveyance or flow, these areas of, of dense fracture and conduit flow. We know there's going to be areas with low levels of denitrification, low nitrogen loss rate. And then we know there's going to be land uses where uh, there's going to be a high nitrogen load, a high nitrogen source rate. So in terms of siting projects, that's the sweet spot there where you'd really like to, to put projects where you have all three of these things coming together, projects which reduce uh, nitrogen loading and reduce groundwater withdrawal, uh, or maybe in those uh, areas where two of the things come together. And if not, you know, just trying to pick, uh, pick one of those areas. That was how we hope to apply this knowledge. Um, there's some of the results. So that is the, uh, the, the main Silver Springs spring shed that we use. Uh, there is Silver Springs, the Silver Springs group right about there, I think. And um, um, uh, the um, most of, of, of that spring shed is in Marion County with a little bit extending north into Alachua and Putnam counties and a little bit south into Sumter and Lake counties. Um, most of the western half of the spring shed is the more developed where there are these very sandy porous soils, kind of the karst plains and ridges. The brown uh, is, uh, is agricultural land use and the pink is some type of urban residential type land use. And not surprisingly, we saw the higher concentrations of nitrate, those little dots of the different colors at the bottom there in the legend those are wells with uh, average nitrate concentrations and the higher are associated with the, um, the agricultural and the, and the uh, urban land uses, um, pretty much in that order. Uh, we saw the highest uh, groundwater nitrates in the, uh, in the ag areas. Um, there was a group that did a substantial amount of modeling, like the pretty, pretty sophisticated stuff, trying to look at uh, flow through the aquifer. And as you can imagine, we're dealing with an area of hundreds of square miles in extent in terms of the aquifer, but we're studying it by wells, these little pinpricks, needle pricks down there, try to figure it out. So they use some of that data and some GIS, uh, you know, data on um, fracture tracing in the spring shed, a little bit of ground penetrating radar. And they use modeling to try to predict or project where the conduit flow was. These were some of the more reliable results. And again, it seemed like most of the conduit flow was right around the head spring, which is that black dot uh, more or less in the, uh, in the middle there. And then we did a lot of work. Um, this was mainly uh, Jim Jowitz, I think, uh, and his student, Mike Annable, who's on the right there, um, did a lot of well sampling using this, these passive flux meters that, um, that might develop basically to try to get a better idea of directions and rates of groundwater flow and solute transport in the aquifer. Um, so they did a, a, this work in a, in a number of, um, of um, um, springs, but a number of wells, but again, 
we're trying to figure out what's going on over a big area with just these little point sampling things. This was some of Mike's data. Most of the data from the passive flux meters, the red uh, showed relatively low groundwater flow rates in meters per day. Um, Mike and his coworkers did do some BHD, some borehole dye tracing. Some of that showed some higher rates of groundwater flow. And then there was actually an earlier study done a few years earlier with uh, Karst Environmental actually dumping dye down sinkholes um, and, uh, and wells. These are the dye tracer tests, the DTT, and they de generally showed the highest rates of, um, of groundwater flow or flux you know, on the order of tens to even hundreds of meters per day of groundwater movement. So, um, how much of this is specific to silver? A lot of it is. Uh, some of it we think is translatable to other springs. In terms of that second objective, determining uh, whether just focusing on nitrate is, is going to reduce the algal growth, uh, much of this was um, work done by Matt Cohen. Um, in general, we found that um, the submerged vegetation community, uh, macrophytes and algae, as well as overall ecosystem primary production, was generally not nitrogen limited, neither in Silver River, or they did some sampling in Alexander Springs, uh, up, up at the head spring of Alexander, which is a, a spring in Lake County, southeast of Silver Springs. This is often used as kind of a control spring because nitrate levels in this spring are at that background level, 0.05 or so milligrams per liter. Um, work done out at the Whitney Lab, elevated nitrate concentrations, do not appear to inhibit macrophyte growth or physiology. And these results generally indicated that uh, focusing on nitrate isn't going to um, reduce the algal abundance. This was some of Matt's work. He used these benthic boxes set out in Silver River and Alexander, which uh, he could either leave them as is or he could spike them with uh, concentrations of nitrogen or phosphorus or combinations. And um, he developed this, uh, and this is gross primary produ production or gross primary productivity, the overall amount of plant biomass produced by the, uh, the entire plant community. And he developed this GPP response ratio so he could plot it where uh, if the value was greater than zero, that indicated stimulation or enhancement of gross primary pro productivity. And if it was below zero, it would be, there'd be some kind of inhibition going on. The um, take home message from this graph is that because of that variability, there was no statistically significant difference among any of these treatments. So the conclusion would be that, that nitrate isn't a factor here affecting gross prior production. If nitrate gets high enough, it can, for various reasons, inhibit the growth of macrophytes. Uh, this was, and this was some work that Dr. Todd Osborne did down in, uh, over at the, um, the Whitney Marine Lab. He had these outdoor mesocosms on the, on the left there. These were flow through systems. And uh, he and I and another investigator here at St. John's did a, a literature review paper which suggested this could be a factor. So Todd looked at this and he, he used a, a control and three nitrate concentrations up to five milligrams per liter nitrate. And he looked at morphological changes and he looked at uh, Vallisneria and he looked at Sagittaria, so he grew these in pots and uh, put them in the treatments. And he looked at various kinds of morphological um, features of these two plants. He looked at anatomical features and he looked at the activity of certain enzymes and again, found no significant differences between any of these. What he did find in those outdoor mesocosms was um, uh, there was a stimulatory effect of nitrate on algal growth. He had the periphotometers with the glass microscope slides. And so um, significant differences across the board with the highest algal accumulation in the highest um, nitrate treatment. Looking at other drivers, um, we learned that water velocity is, is important. And we already kind of knew that, particularly in influencing algal abundance. Um, one of the uh, graduate students looked at epiphyte burdens on macrophytes. Matt Cohen's work found that, as Odom found 50 some odd years ago, light levels and temperature are, are important for overall uh, community production and respiration. 
And some of the work that John Martin did, and, and uh, really we probably need to follow up on that some more, is sediments may be an important factor. So uh, Nathan Reaver, uh, one of David Kaplan's students, did use both existing data and some uh, in-field experiments to look at current effects on algal abundance, as well as the, the rooted macrophytes. He found that um, for the, the epiphytes, he called it the periphyton, but the epiphytic algae growing on the grass blades, uh, their abundance was significantly reduced above a threshold of about 0.22 uh, meters per second current velocity. But he didn't find any effect on macroalgal mats or uh, the vascular plants. And again, this is a little enigmatic because a few years earlier, uh, another UF student, Sean King, uh, working in uh, environmental engineering sciences in Gum Slough, which is a spring-fed stream uh, in, in the uh, southern Withlacoochee Basin, he found a current effect did affect macroalgae. So, um, you know, something, something going there. Uh, these were some of the field experiments that Nathan did. He put out these baffles, which slowed the current and allowed the epiphytes to accumulate. You can see behind that baffle, the epiphytic growth uh, versus the areas where the current is still flowing. And then when he took the baffle away, the, uh, the epiphytes were all stripped away. This was a combination of both the physical effect of the current and um, the grass blades scraping against one another you know, as they, as they uh, feathered about in the, in the current. And then to support some of the hydrologic modeling that we did, um, we did some dye trace releases. And I just always love showing these pictures because it's just so, it's so biblical. It's like Dan Aykroyd told the mayor of New York in the first Ghostbusters, real Old Testament stuff. So, uh, so a diver would release this red rhodamine dye right in the, at the spring vent, which is, um, sort of near and in front of that raft sitting out in the, in the head spring there. And then they would track the movement of this dye all the way down the Silver River to the, to the Okawaha. One of the things we found out here was in the 70s, the private uh, concern that was managing the Silver Springs attraction dug this side channel and then they had uh, cages and pens with exotic animals and they'd have a jungle river cruise but we found that a fair amount of the flow out of the head spring, silver head spring, is uh, scalped off by this, um, by this side channel. We did discuss with the park folks potentially putting some kind of a weir up there to force more of that flow down the Silver River itself. They were a little reluctant on that because uh, now that the Park Service totally operates this attraction, um, they have a private vendor right by where that leftmost white arrow is, who operates a canoe and kayak rental. And uh, th that side channel has become a very popular uh, kayak and canoeing trail. Um, and eventually it does go back into the Silver River anyhow. So, but that was uh, some of the things we, we thought of there. Uh, I see I'm starting to run short of time, so I'm gonna move quick, but so, um, the, uh, uh, again, effects of light on uh, primary production, very important. And then some of the biology, you know, again, this idea of what else what, uh, might be influencing other than nitrate, the primary producer communities. We found that very few um, primary consumers, herbivores, plant eaters, feed on those extensive mats of the benthic filamentous, what we call nuisance algae, primarily the lingbia, and Vaucheria that, uh, as Odom found, that, that the, the macrophyte with its epiphytes was a, a main food base for plant consumers, found that grazing rates of most of your small consumers, snails and crustaceans, uh, were pretty equal to algal growth rates. In other words, they didn't really have the capability to, uh, to graze down the algae. And so in general, in Silver River, grazing doesn't appear to be a major control on algal abundance. Again, this contrasts with some prior work a few years ago of one of Matt Cohen's students, which mainly working further to the north in Ishtupni and Gilchrist Blue Spring found that grazing was important. So I wish I could do a little basic ecology lesson here, but uh, I'm running out of time. So what we did to look at the Silver River food web, we used stable isotopes of carbon and nitrogen. Um, and again, I just don't really, I'm running out of time to, uh, to talk about this, but to evaluate who was eating who, uh, very sophisticated chemical analysis, looking at um, the ratios of carbon-13 to carbon-12 
a nitrogen 15 to nitrogen 14, you come up with a delta C and a delta N number. This is a very simple, this kind of shows how we interpret those data. So you put the delta C on the X axis, you graph it there, and the delta N on the Y axis of a graph, and you can see how it breaks out. Your primary producers, your plants, are kind of low and to the left. Then you get this very characteristic shift up and to the right uh, because of the differences between how these two isotopes are used in the cells of the organism. So you get the primary consumers and the secondary consumers and the tertiary consumers. And so there's what we found for Silver, Silver River, for Silver Springs. Um, so there's your primary producers, uh, four major groups, the nuisance algae on the left, well, other filamentous algae, but they don't form the extensive mats, what we call the free living algae. Uh, next one, next one over is that SAV epi, that's the macrophytes with their epiphytes. And then on the very right there, the green box, those are the emergent plants like the arrowhead and pickleweed and, and such, as well as detritus that comes in from the uh, adjacent floodplain swamps. And then we've got the primary consumers, the herbivores. Uh, the way this is interpreted is if the green dot is kind of near the green square, that means some of its nutrition is coming from that. And you'll notice that that, that nuisance algae, the NUS out there on the left, is kind of out there all by itself. About the only thing we found that really seems to eat that algae is um, that first green circle on the left there, the trichoptera. It's a group of aquatic insects called caddisflies. And uh, they appear to derive some of their nutrition from the nuisance algae and some from the free living algae. But most of those primary consumers, the green dots, are kind of centered over the SAV epi and the emergent vegetation. So that suggests they're either grazing on the algae, growing on those plants, or they're feeding on the detritus from those plants. And then again, there's the uh, primary or the secondary consumers, which include omnivores, and there's the top predators. Then we did, uh, the UF folks did these little, these little aquarium mesocosm experiments growing some of the different major taxa of algae. Um, and, uh, and then they uh, run these trials with um, various small grazers. The picture on the bottom there is a snail. That's the Florida alemia or the Florida river horn snail. And they would measure the rates of algal growth and grazing. And the upshot, and this was some of the results of that. So on the bottom there are the different um, major species of filamentous algae from Silver Springs. These are also found in many, many other uh, springs. Um, and then some of the uh, algal grazers they looked at, uh, four snails and a couple of crustaceans, grass shrimp and crayfish. Again, these are found in many Florida Springs. And then the way they sort of graph this out is very kind of similar to what Matt did with his uh, GPP index. Basically, if it's up around zero, it means it's a zero sum game. The algae are growing about as fast as the grazers are eating it. So nobody's getting ahead of anybody. About the only thing we found is uh, the grass shrimp uh, grazing on either uh, Clodophora on the left there, which is a green alga, or way over on the right, the Vaucheria, which is a, a xanthophyte, a yellow green alga he was kind of able to, to get ahead of it in terms of grazing it faster than it could grow. So again, running out of time, but um, so we didn't really put, a, put the bullseye on, on nitrogen or nitrate. It just did not seem to be a factor in the Silver River system, but there's a lot of scientific literature that indicates you know, worldwide, it is a factor in aquatic ecosystems due to potentially eutrophication, uh, increasing algal growth or inhibitory effects on macrophytes. Nitrate can be toxic if it gets high enough, can have human and animal health effects. We know that some of that nitrate coming out of Silver Springs is going all the way through the Silver River and getting down to the Okalaha and thence to the St. John's. And acidification, although that may not be an issue in the spring run streams, there is a robust body of, of other studies in uh, Florida Springs, which show that nitrate is a factor in uh, promoting increased algal abundance and growth. These are some of the studies we've cited, some of the work that I did in the Wakaiva River system when I came on board here at St. John's. And then even a little bit of that, what I showed you, that graph of the, um, of the uh, algal uh, abundance in the, the mesocosm work done out at uh, Whitney. 
And then, you know, if you've ever seen any of Matt Cohen's presentations, you know, Matt basically says nitrate is not a factor. Um, but uh, this is out of his chapter in the CRISP report. And this is, this is Matt speak for saying, but we still have to worry about nitrate for other reasons, as I've, as I've indicated. And then I'm going to, so we, we have been implementing some Springs projects. Um, this is one that's kind of actively going. If you go to uh, Blue Spring, you know, as you're driving out French Avenue from Orange City, just before you get to the park entrance, there's this old sand mine. Uh, we helped buy that, and uh, we're working with the counties and, and, uh, and DEP to convert this into a wetland recharge area. Um, working on that now, very similar to the newly opened Ocala uh, wetland treatment recharge area or the Sweetwater uh, wetland area in Payne's Prairie that drains to um, Lachway Sink. So in terms of conclusions, um, you know, we think we, we've learned certain areas of the spring shed will yield more bang for the buck in terms of where we would, would locate projects. And we're trying to use some of what we learned here, you know, as part of our, when we select projects for cost share funding, um, at least for Silver River, just focusing on nitrate doesn't appear to, to it's not gonna reduce the algae. Overall, we saw weak relationships between water quality and primary producer community characteristics. Like in other systems, current velocity certainly appears to be important. So we do got to worry about spring flows. You know, we kind of envisioned silver as sort of the model spring run ecosystem, but I've talked with Dr. Chuck Jacoby. Some of you might know Chuck, and he used to be at UF, Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences. We've got him now. He's a supervising environmental scientist for our uh, coastal section. Um, you know, even though we think some of what we've learned here can be applicable to other springs, is there a model spring run ecosystem? Because there's quite a bit of variability. You know, we did another project um, with a consultant, consulting firm in conjunction with CRISPS, and I'm working on analyzing and working up those data now. And every spring is a little different. It just has its own individual characteristics. And kind of my take home message, we're, we're not giving up on, uh, on nitrogen management. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, there's my email. You know, certainly um, I'm here. Uh, you can you can contact me, and I'm going to turn it back to uh, back to Shelley. Thank you, Rob. That was fantastic. Um, so we've got we've got. I mean, we have 15 minutes for questions or to follow up on anything else that you didn't have a chance to explain as much as you wanted. Um, so at this point. Uh, people are welcome to put their questions in the chat. Um, the only questions at, so far in the chat, well, one goes back to the beginning, um, which I think I know the answer to, but I'll let you answer it if you want, is the what's the definition of a first magnitude spring? And I know it has to do with the amount of water that comes out, but I don't yes. know the number. Okay, the, um, the, the spring magnitude system was developed by um, some hydrologists with the U.S. Geological Survey, particularly a guy named Meinzer or Meinzer, I can't, I've heard his name pronounced both that ways, back in the early 1900s. And it's a, a first magnitude spring, by definition, is it, it has a mean annual discharge of greater than 100 cubic feet per second. Or if you do the math, that works out to about 65 million gallons a day. And then the system goes down. There's second magnitude, third magnitude, actually goes down to eighth magnitude, which is like pints per minute or something like that. But uh, the largest springs in terms of, of their flow are the first mag. And yeah, greater than average annual flow, greater than 100 cubic feet per second. Great, thank you. And then someone asked about suntan lotion in the water. Could that have an impact? Should we be using degradable lotion like that's suggested for coral reefs? I'm aware of the, the coral reef issue. Um, I, you know, I, I'm not aware that anybody has looked at that for springs. Um, so yeah, that one's kind of still the big question mark. Uh, someone asked, were you able to determine what caused the initial introduction of the algae that hadn't been in the springs that hadn't been in the springs in the 1950s. Well, and yeah, I didn't get a chance maybe to make that clear. All of these species of algae that we're looking at have always been there. Odom found them back in the 50s. 
Um, there, there was uh, another study of, of algae in Florida Springs that actually this fellow named Whitford who worked with Odom. You know, these algae have always been present in, in Florida Springs, but something has somehow changed to where they are now much more abundant and much more prevalent than they were back in the 50s and earlier. Uh, something has, has been, you know, promoting their growth and proliferation. And that's what we're st still, I think, trying to, trying to get our arms around. So similar to, you know, a lot of our uh, Florida lakes with algal problems, uh, the, uh, the, the algal blooms and such, is that those algae have always been there. But in this case, the, the eutrophication, the nutrient enrichment of the lake has changed the, uh, the, the algal abundance. Okay, thank you. And uh, the next question, why have spring velocities been reduced? I've been seeing a big reduction on Santa Fe River Springs over the last few years. The um, Florida Geological Survey folks kind of looked at that. Uh, they looked at overall changes in spring flows in a report they did about 10 years or so ago. They attributed it to um, two things. Uh, changes in, in rainfall recharge patterns, you know, due to climate change. So, you know, the springs just are not getting the recharge that, uh, that they used to. And kind of layered on top of that is uh, increased groundwater pumping, uh, pumping out groundwater for, um, um, you know, uh, city water supply, agricultural pumping, and, uh, and, and, and all of, for human uses in general. Bottled water? <laughs> That is, is really a very minor component of the overall pumping. The two biggies are ag and, you know, the big utilities, you know, feeding water to the cities. Okay, um, what has been done to reduce agricultural nitrogen and land spreading of biosolids from urban WWTPS? Okay, um, for ag, and I know this has been a topic of criticism, but um, agric uh, farmers implement change their, their, their uh, practices in the, under this umbrella of, of practices called BMPs or best management practices. Um, some folks have criticized you know, as, as to whether they're actually working or not, but currently in state law, it, it says you know, farmers shall implement you know, BMPs. And in some cases, uh, it's a totally voluntary. The farmer can elect to do it or not. Uh, although under the Springs and Aquifer Protection Act, if, if a, a farm is within um, one of these priority Florida Springs, um, they, they have to implement these BMPs. And I know there's been talk about trying to take it to the next level, you know, look at, at, at um, best management practices that, that are um, sort of much more advanced. So that's the one thing on the farms. Now, the other thing that was mentioned was the um, spreading of, of, of biosolids or residuals um, that's mainly been a big issue in the Upper St. John's Basin. So it, it's, it's I'm, 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 although there is some that, that occurs in, in Central Florida, actually in the Wakaiva Basin. But what this stuff is, is it's, it's, it's when at the very end of the sewage treatment process, you're left with this sludge type uh, material um, that, you know, you have to do something with it. So the, the state has a, a permitting program that allows it to be applied on agricultural lands, mainly pastures, um, to, 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 as a sort of organic fertilizer. And I think a secondary element of this is uh, when folks get their septic tank uh, pumped, you know, that, that sludge also is, is, is regarded as this. Um, but um, some of the changes that have occurred uh, it, it, uh, to uh, try to protect Lake Okeechobee and the Everglades, some years ago, the legislature ban the application of these biosolids down in South Florida. So it's kind of been moving north here and it appears to be uh, definitely causing impacts in some lakes. And we haven't really looked at, you know, if, uh, if uh, springs are feeling the effect of this. For springs, we've really mainly more focused on um, urban residential land uses, um, you know, a number of which are not on sewer. Every house has a septic tank. So that can be a source of nitrate loading to groundwater uh, or uh, agriculture, particularly up in the, uh, in the Suwannee Basin. Okay, someone asked, I think you already answered that. Um, what, what is the effect of domestic animals like E. coli from dog feces? Um, 
Occasionally, we do know that the bacteria can get to the get to the springs. I mean, um, occasionally, I believe they've had to close uh, Volusia Blue Spring because of um, high bacterial levels, but it doesn't appear to be coming from the actual spring. Uh-oh, it seems as though Rob has frozen. Let's give him a minute and see if he comes back. I'm gonna go ahead and launch this poll while we're waiting. Um, it's just a real quick survey of if you thought this was useful today, if you wanna go ahead and fill that out. Um, I'm gonna unmute Rob so he can Continue. You should be able to unmute. Okay, now am I back? Yes. Okay. Um, are you ready for a question? Yes. Okay. Uh, what was the relationship between nitrate concentrations and primary productivity at Wakaiva and Silver Springs during the 50 year retrospective study and the PLRG study? Okay. Um, so as part of the Wakaiva PLRG effort, um, Bob Knight did do some, some prior productivity uh, estimates in, in Wakaiva. And then actually the DEP took some of those data and, um, and, and they used it to develop their um, total maximum daily load or TMDL for the Wakaiva system. And, and they, they did find that um, primary productivity, I believe, I believe they found, it's been a long time since I looked at that, uh, they did see kind of an inhibitory effect on primary productivity um, with, uh, with increasing nitrate levels. And the 50-year retrospective study, I believe, also documented somewhat lower um, primary productivity in Silver River now versus, uh, you know, the 50, 50 odd years ago. Although additional measurements after that, you know, it seemed to be as high now as it was back when Odom did uh, his, uh, his studies. So it, it does, does vary, which kind of depends, I guess, on time of the year that you do it, uh, temperature and light. Um, so I think we're still kind of trying to learn on that. All right, thanks. Um, Lucinda asked, about bottled water may account for small percentages of water use in different areas. However, water use has cumulative effects on our springs, so bottling should not be discounted. How do the water management districts account for cumulative effects when they make judgment calls on issuing water use permits? That one's a tough one because I do not get involved in permitting. I mean, certainly if, if you were to email me that question, I'll forward it over to our consumptive use permitting folks. Um, you know, from what I know, yes, they do consider cumulative effects. Um, okay. Um, Carly asks, I see a lot of funded studies that really do not provide the solution. Unregulated growth has not been addressed. Unregulated growth by developers, extraction of water from aqua filter, not from farmers input. Maybe that's just a comment. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah, you know, um, I've been tangentially involved with land use. I mean, when I worked at Swanee and I, and I lived in um, um, Columbia County, I actually served a term on the Columbia County Planning and Zoning Board. Um, you know, that's number one, land use is, is, is in Florida, it's a local government thing. It's managed at the local level in terms of, of development and such. Um, each local government, you know, has its land development regulations. And if a, if a development um, meets all of those criteria, you know, I would have to vote to approve a, a development. I couldn't just say no as a, as a commissioner, just because I didn't like it. Um, so some of these decisions are really not scientific decisions, they're political decisions. Great, thanks. Um, someone asked, so this is actually from the Facebook Live page, they asked, what about the effects of human bacteria waste in the springs? 
Um, certainly, yes. Um, you know, um, that's actually a, a issue we're kind of dealing with on the Wakaiva. Uh, the Wakaiva is uh, is one of Florida's only two national wild and scenic rivers, and you know we're trying to promote more folks um, using the river. Um, but you know they have to have a place to to do their business. So we've we've uh, in the, I, I serve on the Wild and Scenic Management Committee, and we've been kind of looking at you know small toilet type facilities on the river so people don't just go off into the floodplain and do their business. There's a big issue also at Silver Glen Spring. If you're familiar with Silver Glen, they get a lot of boat traffic um, in that spring, you know, especially on weekends and holidays. And again, people were going off into the woods to do their business. So what, um, what was worked out was um, um, if they come in the spring on a boat and they got to do their business, they can come ashore onto the day use area to use one of the porta potties without having to pay the day use fee. Then they got to go back to their boat. So the uh, private concern that manages the, that day use area at Silver Glen Head Spring, you know, they work with the uh, National Forest who owns it um, and, uh, and work that out to where folks can come ashore and then, um, and then go back to their boat. Well, someone says suggest that people use a uh, wag bag to defecate in and take. Yeah. Yeah, that's one that. of the things we've been looking at in Wakaiva. You know, having um, a bag station. Yep. We just have a couple minutes left. Um, let's see. Cynthia asked, have PFOA and PFOS been found in Florida Springs? And maybe define what those are, because I don't even know what those are. It's obviously some kind of chemical. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, we'll move on to the next one. I don't know what those are. Um, maybe maybe Cynthia can define those. Uh, Neil asks, could the amount of water being removed from the springs for the increased population growth and its reduced flow have a primary impact on algal growth? Um, the, the relatively simple answer is yes. You know, if the spring flow is reduced and the current in the spring run is reduced, our results show that generally you get more algae, either because of you know direct physical sloughing off or the movement of the grass blades um, kind of rubbing it off. So yes, that can be a factor. Okay, and then James asked if shallow wells for lawn irrigation can affect the spring's aquifer. It kind of depends to me whether they draw from the, the florin or not, or are they drawing from a different aquifer? So if they're drawing from a shallower aquifer, no, they're probably not going to be affecting spring flow. If there's enough of them drawing from the Floridan, um, the, the thought is possibly, I, I think the science on that has yet to be worked out, but I know there's been some concern in Marion County because there's tons of little uh, private wells, um, you know, folks with their own, getting their own water from, from well. So that's something that, that still could be looked at. Okay, and then just to wrap it up, it's four o'clock, but just to respond back, Cynthia said, uh, those are chemicals found in sludge, especially from paper mills. Hmm. So I don't know if you have an answer for that. But. Yeah, no, I, I don't. There's the US, the US Geological Survey has done a little bit of, you know, these kind of emerging contaminants. They've looked in Silver Springs uh, and I know DEP, it's, it's kind of on their radar. Um, very difficult to sample for. So at this point, we don't know if it's a really big problem or not yet. Okay. Well, let's wrap it up. It's four o'clock. So um, I greatly appreciate you coming and sharing this information with us today. Um, very useful. And for everyone, um, this program will be, recording of this program will be up online on the blog post probably about a week. It takes me to get it clipped and get it uploaded. Um, and then next month in February, we will be back um, on the date. It will be February 18th at from 3 to 4 p.m. We'll be here with Dr. James Leary, who's from the Agronomy Department and the Center for Aquatic and Invasive Plants with IFAS. And he's going to be talking about the um, also uh, kind of on the same vein of aquatic health, um, talking about mechanical harvesting and how that relates to the broader impacts of managing aquatic plants in public water bodies. 
So I think if you found this interesting, hopefully this will be um, along the same kind of um, thinking. So um, thanks everyone for being here and um, let me know as always, if you have any future suggestions and thank you, Rob, very much. Okay, thanks a lot.